Hey there, just taking a little stroll through the universe. See, we're so excited about season two of Pi, the sky is not even the limit for us. So the theme of this week's show is space, the infinite and beyond. We've even got Brian Lowe here from 98.1 Classical King FM to give us a little soundtrack on his theremin. Hey, Brian. We'll hear more from Brian in just a sec. First though, NASA's space shuttle program was officially retired in 2011. NASA's now developing the Orion spacecraft to journey further into space than we've ever gone before. But part of the shuttle program is still alive at the Museum of Flight, where visitors can see just what it was like to be an astronaut blasting into orbit. It was so cool. Because there's like so many buttons that interest me. It's a one-to-one -one representation of an actual space shuttle without the wings. You see the FFT from the outside and it's, it's huge. Uh, but you get into that crew compartment and it's, it's 200 square feet. There's a yellow bar, grab it with both hands, and then just do a little pull up and slide right on. And the way I like to describe it is imagine going on vacation, 200 square foot condo, you and six of your best friends, okay? One shower, one toilet, and the front door's welded shut. Now I'm gonna start right over here with this big hatch. Now this is kind of- All 355 astronauts who flew on the space shuttle uh, did their habitability training within the FFT. Welcome to the flight deck of the space shuttle. This is the main instrument panel for the space shuttle. It's about 2,100 different dial switches and controls. Wow. Uh, these were all the controls that you needed in order to actually fly into space. It's really, really a cool combination of regular aircraft stuff and regular spacecraft stuff. Now this other side of the panel here is used to control the Canada arm, or the big robotic arm that we have out there. If you're eating 3,000 calories a day of food, that's a lot of food, that means you're going to have to deal with the end product of that. All right, this is where it all happens. This is the shuttle bathroom, or what NASA likes to call the waste management system. You can see on this wall here, there's a checklist of all the steps you had to go through um, in order to make this uh, toilet work and to do it safely and to do it properly. So um, it took probably a good hour to go to the bathroom on the space shuttle. Thanks for coming. Now that we're back down to the mid-deck, this completes our tour of the full fuselage trainer here at the Museum of Flight. Uh, but before we go, we've got one last thing that we have to do, and that's actually getting through the hatch to get back in. Does it make you want to be an astronaut? Yes, very much. The bathroom situation, it's gross, but it's cool at the same time. I would encourage people to come and see it and experience it and get a sense of that history of spacecraft and, and actually what it took to go into space and what that experience was like. You know, there's a lot of cool space stuff at the Museum of Flight, so I'm heading over right now to take a look. One to beam over. That's better. I'm here now, we're at the Museum of Flight, and behind me is their exhibit, Space Exploring the New Frontier, and they have everything here. They have an Apollo capsule, a moon rover, a life-size replica of part of the International Space Station, and of course, the FFT, also known as the Space Shuttle Trainer, which is where every astronaut who ever went into the shuttle trained, right on this guy right behind me, including local astronaut Wendy Lawrence, and I have Wendy here with me now. Good morning. Wendy. So, four trips on the shuttle uh, over 1,200 hours in space. What are you up to now? Well, I still I keep a little bit of uh, an association with the space program. I have an opportunity to work part-time at the visitor's complex at Kennedy Space Center. It's a program called Astronaut Encounters. So there are about 30 retired astronauts who have an opportunity to share spaceflight experiences with the visitors at the complex. You are also a uh, helicopter pilot, so I figured we would go check out the simulator around the corner and see if you uh, still have the chops to land well, one of those crafts. 
I'll warn you, that actually was one of my technical assignments at Johnson Space Center, was to do the verification of the software on board each shuttle flight. So part of my job was landing the simulator. Mm, so you might have me beat, is what you're saying? I might. Okay, mm, let's, go, let's go check it out. So Wendy, over 12, 1,200 hours in space, what was the longest time at one, one period that you spent in space? My first flight, STS-67, ended up being about 16 and a half days long. And on that flight, we had three telescopes out in our payload base, so we were conducting some observations in the ultraviolet part of the uh, spe electromagnetic spectrum. Sixteen and a half days seems like a very long time after visiting that shuttle. Remember, we can float. <laughs> <laughs> All the overhead space is available to us, so no, actually, uh, time just flew by, so uh, I think I was not ready to come home yet. Really? Do you, is there part of you that misses it? Oh, very much so. Um, I think it goes without saying that the view out the window is ab absolutely spectacular. Um, we work very hard with our, uh, through our video and the still pictures that we take to capture just how pretty this Earth is, but we still fall short. It's an incredibly beautiful planet, so um, I never got bored looking out the window. What, what are you looking forward to in space travel? What do, you, what do you hope to see someday in the future? I'd like to actually see more people have an opportunity to go into space, and so I'm a supporter of the efforts now that NASA has going on with the commercial spaceflight companies like SpaceX, uh, Sierra Nevada, and Boeing, helping them develop a human-rated spacecraft that eventually can uh, carry um, non-professional astronauts. I think uh, if more people had an opportunity to see the world from our perspective when we're up in space I think it would change their views on a lot of things so I think uh, we're probably about five to ten years away from them being able to really open that up to many many more paying passengers so you think that general population travel to space could happen in our lifetime yes I do actually I you know, like I said SpaceX is off to a great start I think they've demonstrated with their Dragon capsule, the ability to send it into space and recover it safety, safely. So tell me one thing, I'm sure that there are tons of misconceptions that we have about space. Tell me one thing that you think people might be surprised to know about space travel. I like to tell people there are really a couple of things that you have to experience to truly appreciate. I don't know they're necessarily surprising, it's just that our ability to really simulate how that part of the mission is going to feel. You just don't have that ability. Riding the rocket is right up there. I mean, the simulators that we had at Johnson Space Center, they give you a general idea of what it was going to feel like, but there is nothing like tr experiencing on your own 6.5 million pounds of thrust. And the solid rocket boosters and the three main engines on the shuttle, when they combined their output, that was the level of thrust. And so when you experience that for the first time, you just, oh my gosh. I, I mean, it, it was a kick in the pants. <laughs> you know, literally, it <laughs> felt like somebody had just put you in this massive slingshot and let go of you, and you just, you could feel the moment that you left the, the launch pad. So um, that was just a, a remarkable experience, and I never got bored of riding the rocket. I, I could talk to you all day. This has been so fascinating. Thank you, Wendy. You're very welcome, Molly. Thank you. Well, that was awesome, but it's time to get back to the studio. So beat me up.